So what is philosophy? Well, the word philosophy comes from philia and sophia equals philosophy. So etymologically, it means love of wisdom. And the Greeks had at least seven different words to describe the different senses of love, the different kinds of love that human beings can feel. And some of them were eros, which was a sensual kind of sexual love. There was storgi, which was like a family or familial love. There was agape, which was considered an unconditional, all-encompassing general love. Some translate that as a Christian love. And then there was philia, which meant um, an attraction to or a, or a disposition towards. You're just drawn to something. Um, it, it's also considered um, friendly love. So that's the type of love that um, philosophy, the word philosophy, is emphasizing. Here's some more formal definitions of philosophy. In a broad sense, philosophy is an activity people undertake when they seek to understand fundamental truths about themselves and the world in which they live and their relationships to the world and to each other. And as an academic discipline, philosophy is much the same. Those who study philosophy are perpetually engaged in asking, answering, and arguing for answers to life's most basic questions. To make such a pursuit more systematic, academic philosophy is traditionally divided into major areas of study, like most academic disciplines are. Right? You've got a broad category, and then there's subsets within it, and I just wanted to take a look at some of those. So first, there's metaphysics, and that concerns the theory of reality and the ultimate nature of all things. Um, the aim of metaphysics is a comprehensive view of the universe, kind of an overall worldview. It's a lofty aim. So the sorts of questions that metaphysics asks are, for instance, why is there something rather than nothing? Is time real or is it an illusion? Is space real or is it an illusion? Is causation real or an illusion? What's consciousness? Do humans have immaterial souls? Are humans free? Or are we determined? And does God truly exist? Next, we have epistemology. And epistemology is the philosophical study of knowledge, including its nature, scope, and limits. And some of the questions that epistemology asks are what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for having what we call knowledge? What's it possible to know? How precisely do we come about knowledge? What exactly do we mean by truth? Can we truly know anything at all and to what degree? Next, we have axiology as the third major branch of philosophy. And that's the study of value and the distinction between value and fact. So under axiology, there's two main subdivisions. One is ethics and one is aesthetics. So ethics is the study of good and bad, right or wrong, the search for the good life, and the defense of the principles and rules of morality. And some of those questions include, what is the greatest good? How can I know right from wrong? Do they even exist objectively? How should I live? And then aesthetics is the study of the nature of art and the experiences we have when we enjoy the arts or take pleasure in nature. And some of those questions include, what makes something beautiful? What makes something ugly? Is beauty subjective or objective? What's the difference between art and mere expression? Is there one? And then there is logic. Logic is kind of like verbal mathematics, really. So logic is the study of the formal and informal structures of sound thinking and good argumentation, including premises and conclusions, deductions, deduction versus induction, the evaluation of arguments, common and formal fallacies. Some of you may have taken a critical thinking course, and you may have studied some of these things. 
um, the different types of logic are syllogistic, propositional, predicate, modal. There are many different types of logic. There are also many different types of philosophy. Once you understand that philosophy is a method as opposed to um, just content, right? It's a way of going about investigating different things. You can pretty much attach anything to the end of philosophy. I mean, there's philosophy of law, philosophy of religion, of mind, political philosophy, philosophy of history, philosophy of science, philosophy of literature, philosophy of the arts, of language. They pretty much just put anything in there. Philosophy of you name it, and you can make it. Really, I'm teaching a course on philosophy of sport this semester. Now, what is rationality? And we've mentioned that word several times so far. But, um, well, it's a matter of dispute. For right now, we can settle on the following. Rationality has to do with the way we proceed to investigate matters, settle disputes, evaluate evidence, and assess people's behaviors, practices, and beliefs. However, this definition underscores a fundamental problem. What are the standards of rationality? Are they subjective or objective? Are they simply within us and do they vary from person to person? Or are there standards of rationality that, in a sense, transcend us, that we all have to measure up to or should try to measure up to? So those who argue that the standards of rationality are objective, kind of outside of us, and that they, um, we all have them in common and ought to seek to develop a, a, a similar standard of rationality, those that camp is known as, um, they're known as the foundationalists. And those who argue that the standards of rationality are subjective, that they are in our minds and can vary from person to person, and one person's rationality is different than another, but just as good as another, those people are known as constructivists. Now, let's take a look at the two different camps here, different theories of rationality. Under the foundationalist camp, their main claim is that there's one rationality that's universal and objective. Right? Beliefs are rational if they're supported by good reasons. <coughs> If an infinite regress of reasons is to be avoided, there must be a foundation of self-evident beliefs. And what an infinite regress means is that you can never stop asking why. If you're trying to convince somebody of X, well, why X? Well, because A. Well, why A? Well, because B. Why B? Because C. That And to continue on ad infinitum, that's what's considered an infinite regress. And it just is something um, un unacceptable to most philosophers. So if an infinite regress of reasons is to be avoided, there must be a foundation of self-evident beliefs, a stopping point going backwards, right? So such foundational beliefs are the laws of logic or clear and distinct ideas or beliefs evident to the senses. Right? So those are some um, characteristics of the foundationalist camp concerning rationality. Now, as for the constructivist camp, their main claim is that there are many rationalities that are local and they're based on intersubjective agreement. Some of their um, characteristics are they claim that rationality is a social construction conditioned by history and culture. Vast amounts of historical, cultural, anthropological, and linguistic evidence support the above claim. And there's no way to transcend our historical and cultural circumstances. So there can be no rational standards, standards which transcend our histor excuse me, historical and cultural circumstances either. So about the constructivists... The foundationalists criticize them thus. 
this amounts to a self-refuting relativism. If all of these rationalities are local and differ from person to person and none is better than the other, then so does the claim that they're making. They can't, they're, they don't quite have a basis for truth, in other words. And we'll get into all that, uh, into the discussions of truth as the course progresses. And the constructivists say this about the foundationalists, that the foundationalists themselves can agree on what counts as foundational beliefs. <laughs> so they must not be self-evident. Its definition of rational beliefs is contradictory and its claims amount to ethnocentric imperialism, meaning that the foundationalists claim that these foundational beliefs, be they laws of logic or clear instinct ideas, typically come from one group of people, namely white males, right? And that's a big criticism that the constructivists have about the foundationalists, that they mistake these foundational beliefs as objective when really they are just the ones common to the dominant social group. I'm sure that in some other course you've studied constructivism, and if, if, you, if so, then that ought, this uh, criticism ought to roughly sound familiar to you. Okay, well, that's it. That's a brief introduction for you. Um, what we're going to be focusing on in this class, if you remember, we looked at those four different main branches of philosophy, and that was metaphysics, epistemology, axiology, and logic. This course focuses on metaphysics and epistemology. So we're not going to be looking into logic as such. We'll be using logic like every philosophy, a philosophical argument ought to, um, but we're not going to be studying it as such. The same for axiology. That's not the focus of this course. So again, we're focusing on metaphysics and epistemology.